you don't know this, but yesterday when I was recording this episode, my camera died. I just continued the rest of my day. I got drunk. I talked to my friend and I went to bed. But now today it is actually my birthday. So welcome to this very special edition of the Creative Hour podcast. This is a video episode. So right now you're either watching this on YouTube or you're watching it on any podcasting platform that you can find. For those that don't know, my name is Prince Shakur. I'm the host of this podcast. I am a cultural essayist, a journalist. I'm a soon to be traditionally published author. My debut memoir titled When They Tell You To Be Good is coming out this October. And it's kind of cool to tell you about it and then to be able to point it at the camera. Um, There is the cover right there. Beautiful yellow lettering, beautiful green lettering. Um, And it's a book that explores my political coming of age. It's about me growing up in a Jamaican family in the US, about growing up black, about growing up queer, about becoming a radicalized through various social movements and you can always you can pre-order the book right now you can pre-order it until it comes out on october 4th and my birthday ask of everyone listening to this podcast is please go out and pre-order my book or if you have pre-ordered it send a link to a friend if you can't pre-order it send a link to a friend share it on social media all of those links to pre-order my book are going to be in the show notes always. So let's get into this episode. This episode is going to be exploring a lot of my kind of emotional state at this point in my life. I think it's really important to sometimes do po- these podcast episodes where I'm just ex- ex- I'm asking myself questions about where I am in my career, my life, my psyche. So we delve into a lot of things, especially some of my favorite points in this conversation that you'll hear are about grief, writing through grief, about double consciousness and how my relationship to double consciousness has changed, and a lot about the process of being a debut author and what I've been processing and what I fear and what I hope for moving forward. So once again, thank you for watching this special edition of The Creative Hour. Um, Stay tuned. Music in this episode is by Sam Holman Smith or provided by Artlist.io. The Creative Hour is typically hosted on Verge FM, which is an online DIY radio station in Columbus, Ohio, or you can find it anywhere where you listen to podcasts. So let's get into this episode. Welcome to the show, Prince. <laughs> um, I wanted to make a little video because around holiday or around birthdays, I always get nostalgic. I always get reflective. I was looking through my Instagram um, archive earlier and I was reposting old things from over the past year and 27 has been wild like when I tell you the past year last year for my birthday this time I was in New Smyrna Beach Florida at a residency that I was going I did not know I was going to flee a week later (laughs) and I was considering my first book deal I was deciding to turn down my first book deal I was seriously thinking about applying to grad school which I eventually did I got into grad school got into one out of five that I applied to And I mean, other things that happened this past year, I mean, I got a book deal. I announced my book deal. I started editing my book. I finished editing my book. I went through copyrights. I worked on another book. I've been working on another book this whole past year. I've been, oh my God. And it's in like applying to grad school, deciding to leave Columbus, like processing leaving. And I mean, there are other things that I've been through in the last year that I'm going to kind of get into later on in this podcast episode, but I just wanted to kind of start in the space where a where I want to acknowledge that a year can contain a lot. As an artist, as a human being, I've been through a lot in the past year. I've also pushed myself in a lot of ways. I did therapy for a number of months this past year. I, oh my God, I just, I think there were just some things that I need to confront. <laughs> and, oh my God. And it's just wild that I'm going to be approaching the age of 28, which in in the grand scheme of things, it's like, oh, I'm still a baby, I'm still young, I'm still in my 20s, but it's also reaching certifiably your later 20s. You're not 24, you're not 23, you're not 25. I feel like 25 is a very cute age. I'm about to be a little boop, 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 a little uncle one day. I'm going to be an uncle one day. And I have friends that are getting married more increasingly. I have friends that are getting divorced. I have friends who are buying houses. Um, my my best friend, someone who was on this podcast, I won't mention who it is, is in the process of buying a house. It's like, it's it's wild. And so I wanted to take this time to really hone in on what's been happening, kind of check in with myself, answer a few hard-hitting questions about where I am in my life right now, which is, I'm currently in Saint-Paul-de-Vence, France. I've been here all of June. 
next month I plan on solo traveling around Europe. Um, solo travel is just something I've been really craving. I've done it in smaller ways over the last few years, but it's been a while since I've done like a longer solo travel trip, meaning more than a long weekend. And I'm going to be traveling for 25 days in July, and I'm excited. I spent this morning booking a bunch of my airfare and my lodging and working out at least the first two weeks of logistics, which to me is a good feeling to like bang that stuff out of the way. Um, and it's just it's just a wild time in my life. Like I finished turning in my novel to my at literary agents a few days ago. I mean, I'm writing, I'm preparing craft lectures for later this year. So there's a lot of things happening and I feel the need to unpack where I am in my life right now. So let's dive into it. Thank you for listening to The Creative Hour. Music on The Creative Hour is by Sam Holman Smith and Artlist.io. The Creative Hour is broadcast on Verge FM and can be found on any podcasting platforms. Stay tuned for this episode. Okay, so I am at this artist residency. I want to take a bit of time to unpack what artist residencies are, what this experience has been like compared to the other ones. Um, once again, I'm with La Maison Baldwin, which is this organization that started a few years ago to, it started out of uh, a couple of people's efforts to save the house that James Baldwin lived in and passed away in here in St. Paul de Vence. It was eventually um, basically destroyed and turned into a condo. I walked by it like a week or two ago. It's very strange. Um, but basically, I'm here all of June. I chose June because there was a James Baldwin conference that, that happened about a week and a half ago. I love being in France, in Europe, in the spring, in the summertime. And basically, I get a month. I have this beautiful cottage that I'm sitting in right now all to myself. I get to work on whatever I want, write whatever I want. Um, Saint Paul de Vence is a small village that is surrounded by fortifications, and it's been around since what the 14 or 1500s. So that'll just tell you there's a lot of history here. I don't know if it's all good, um, but it's very much known or has been known as historically like significant place in southern France for artists to come to. Picasso came here, Cesar came here, James Baldwin came here. I mean, so many other artists. And writers hung out in this town, had studios here, would visit, visit their artist friends, etc. So it is kind of like a weird, strange epicenter. Today, um, the village is mostly a place you go into. You can visit galleries, you can visit restaurants. But I've learned over my month here, it's not very, it's not catered towards locals. Like it used to be a place where you could grocery shop a little and get your little necessities if you lived here. But a lot of people that live here... Uh, go outside of the like the village the fortifications in the evening or the people that stay there I, I don't know it's just like it's not very accessible if you just want to like rent an apartment here and like be able to walk to the grocery store there's no you have to take the bus unless you have a car um and it's been interesting i i oh let me i so this is my sixth residency and i'd say out of all of them in terms of beauty and environment, it's definitely top three. Like this cottage is so beautiful. I mean, it's a lot of wood, a lot of stone, like these beautiful wooden kind of ceiling arch panel things. I honestly don't know how to describe architecture despite being a writer. Um, I have this beautiful little outdoor table and like outdoor space and my room is nice and there's windows so you can let the air in and I really, really, I, like even just like a few days in I was like this is my home <laughs> so that's how I feel I honestly feel so comfortable and as for Saint Paul de Vence I'm definitely one of the few brothers out here I mean I walk around and I know like and I've had people tell me like oh you don't look like you're from around here like you look like different than most people that live here which is fine but um, I, I've described people here as being um, curious in a kind way I haven't felt otherized I mean it can be intrinsically weird anywhere you go where you're a minority in a very specific aesthetic kind of way. And I think having lighter hair, being darker skin, I don't know. I'm just like, I got a vibe. But it's also helped me make friends. Like I have gotten really, I've hung out a lot with these artists that hang out at a bar right near near my cottage. Um, I've gone around to like the local lake with them. We went to Nice together, got food one night. Like they know where the parties are at. So I've been able to have a little bit of fun. Um, and so Saint-Paul-de-Vence has been nice. And I've also just had really 
good conversations with just like different classes of people that live here and I feel like that's kind of a travel rule or travel goal that I have when I go to a place at least try to talk to people from different backgrounds from different classes because I think you get different perspectives even if you're not like tied or close with all of them just have conversations learn a little bit it's a positive thing Um, and as for the work that I've been doing here I have been doing a number of things I've been editing this podcast I have been shooting and editing some YouTube videos some that are coming out right now um i have been pitching out little essay ideas i wrote a film review while i was here i'm going to be writing a piece for lit hub that's going to come out the week that my memoir is published and i've been just trying to send out and cultivate other ideas largely i've been editing my novel um and for those that don't know i'm writing a novel about a 17 year old boy in 1980s south who is overcoming his older brother's death Um, So it's been a project I've been working on since 2020. I actually wrote it in 2014, um, and it's really close to my heart. I feel like this is definitely the first fiction project I've worked on where I really feel like it's my world as a writer. Like, I've worked so... I've gone through so many revisions. Like, for me, it's just like I've gone through a lot of revisions, and it's been really nice to edit it with my agent's feedback because I always kind of like talking through things with other people. And so I've been editing this novel with their feedback in mind since March and it's about to be the end of June and my goal is for this book to be ready to be sold by the end of the year because I am going to need money when I move (laughs) Um, but yeah that's what I've been working on here Um, I've been feeling really nourished in Saint Paul de Vence I've had so many good memories and I've had so many good conversations and I feel like one of the things I wanted leaving Columbus was to feel nourished more socially or more socially nourished and I've definitely had that here um and there are problems with this residency certain logistical things were not planned there's this whole behind the scenes thing that I don't feel like talking about on this podcast episode maybe I will in another episode or video about residencies and the problems that can happen with them but just know that things here aren't perfect but in terms of logistics I get to stay here for a month I get a cottage I've been given travel stipend they also give me grocery money all of things that are amazing and should be basics that all artists should get um, at residencies so that's how this residency has been okay next question is a doozy um it is how do i feel about my first book coming out oh how do i feel about my first book coming out in three months oh wow okay for those that don't oh Oh my god. For those that don't know, my first book, it's a memoir titled When They Tell You To Be Good, is coming out October 4th. It's coming out with Tin House Books. I describe it as my political coming of age through Obama and Trump's America. I talk about Black Lives Matter, um, double consciousness while traveling to the Philippines, South Korea. I talk about um, queerness, about coming of age as a queer person, about unpacking familial patriarchal violence. So it's about a lot of different things. And I feel ready, if that's strange to say. Like, I feel like I've gone through the kind of logistical parts of getting the book, like, edited and working with the Tin House team. Like, I've done most of that work, and I feel like that was the stuff I wanted to do and was nervous about in order to be professional. And now I'm at this point where I'm getting blurbs back. Like, I've been waiting on and getting blurbs back for like the last two or three months and those have been amazing i have a little file that i put my all the positive things that people have said to me about my book because i know i'm gonna need it as a cancer as an empath i'm just gonna i'm gonna need a little folder i go to where i'm like "Uh, people love me in my book so i guess in various ways i am preparing i am backlogging positive praise and feedback things that lift me up i'm taking notes and writing things down so I can kind of prepare for potential interviews or talks I'm going to have about the book, kind of thinking and mining and really rereading sections of the book again to think about the different themes and how they come together and how I can verbalize what the themes are in ways that maybe I haven't before. Um, And I think one thing I was thinking about a lot right before I left Columbus, and I'm glad that I ran into a really good writer friend there. Um, 
I ran into a really good writer friend who is also gay, is also black, and has published a memoir, and it got a lot of acclaim, and we um, just have been like colleagues, and he's been like a good positive source in my life as a creative like ally. And um, a few months before I left Columbus, I had a friend pass away, and this was maybe the day after I decided I needed to not be at home. I wanted to go out, so I went out with Eli my best friend and we went to some bars and I ran into this writer there and we talked about my friend passing away a little bit and I think I just got really real because it's like I'm leaving I'm having all these thoughts about my future and I was like you've gone through all the success you've gone through all these things being an author how do you handle it how do you handle the way people may or may not want to cannibalize you how do you handle the success how do you handle all the eyes on you how do you handle just the, 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 the kind of the illusions of success, especially success at the hands of the white gaze. And he was really real with me. He just said, being successful as a black person, as a black artist, means that white people are probably going to be consuming your work. So you're going to have to contend with that. And you're going to have to figure out how you're going to respond and how you're going to be in those rooms and how you're going to hold on to whatever the reason or reasons are why you do this. And you're going to have to hold on to that and find people that you can trust and that you can rely on. And it was such a real answer. And I was also kind of drunk and he was drunk. And it's just I think that's been the biggest thing that I've been thinking about is I don't and refuse to lose myself in whatever. I don't know, success or acclaim or whatever this book can bring me and. I really want to continue to be someone that's committed to liberation, that's committed to asking hard questions, committed to finding out answers. And I want to be someone that, I don't know. I mean, I don't want this shit to feed my ego. And I don't like when it feeds other people's egos. And I just want to be real about the weird stuff and the hard stuff. And when it feels weird that like maybe success means that people don't read you in the way that you want to be read. And I feel like, a big part of why I left Columbus and why I'm traveling and maybe a part of my fear around this book is that despite having written the most honest thing I ever have in my life, really, um, I guess I just have fears that double consciousness will just take some aspect that, of that away and turn it into something else for other people. And I mean, on one level, as long as people are buying the book, hey, buy it. <laughs> um, but I think it's something as an artist you naturally think about and fear and consider And so that's just been something that's been on my mind a lot. Um, And some other things that have been some highlights of like recently with the book is I got to see my galley copy. Um, It's over there. I don't feel like getting up to get it. But I got to see my galley copy of my book, which is the pre-publication copy of it that usually goes out to reviewers, journalists, booktubers, book influencers, anyone that can kind of sway publicity or whatever for your book. I got to see that literally the week before I left. I'm lucky it came in the mail before I flew to France. And I just, I'm so grateful to have it here with me in this place in honor of James Baldwin. And it's my first book. So it's just, it's just giving me good energy. And in terms of my book, what I'm excited for, I'm excited for people to read it. I'm excited for people to get the emotionality of it. I'm excited to see and hear about how people intake it, how they read it, the different connections that they draw. Like I've just never had many people, this many people read like my book, a book I've written before. And so I think even on that level, it's just, it'll be really illuminating to see the different things that different people get from it and why. Um, I'm excited to see it in a bookstore. I'm excited to do an author event and to do a reading. I'm excited to have my own copy of it that I mark up. I'm excited for, I'm excited for, for this next chapter of my career to begin. Like, honestly, I think that's the biggest thing. I think trying to be an author can be such an uphill hurdle. And when you get there, it's strange because you fought to get there for so long. And I'm really just excited to have my work be respected on a level that not necessarily being an author doesn't allow or permit your work to be accepted. So I'm excited to develop my skills as someone who can talk about craft and how to lecture on that. I'm excited to consider getting into teaching. I'm excited to be on panels, to meet other authors, to just kind of 
understand what it means to make a life out of writing books. And I feel like that's something I've wanted since I was 12. And the fact that it is happening is so amazing. It's so, so amazing. Oh, my God. Yeah. And to see it in a bookstore. And to, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I just can't even. I'm getting goosebumps. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so the next question here is, is what is most compelling about this period of time in your life? Um, oh my God. <laughs> I, have, I have a few bullet points, but I'm just going to go off the dome and go with what my heart is telling me. Um, I am moving and I've been trying to process and unpack all of the reasons why I've wanted to move and all of the reasons why I lived in Columbus and all of the things that it gave me and the things that I feel like it didn't give me and how the pandemic shifted my time there, how I'm entering this new part of my career that's making me kind of want and desire more things. I went through a breakup um, at the beginning of 2020 and dating, of course, is hard for a lot of people. I'm not the most datey, dating, datery out there person. So I've just been questioning a lot of things and like questioning a lot of things about myself and what I want and how I express myself and whether or not how people read me or how I feel ready to express myself is something like w whether or not I've I'm expressing or exhibiting a threshold that is within the boundaries of or what. OK, how can I say this? Whether or not I'm expressing myself in a way that is as honest as my interior life is telling me to. And let me break this down. I moved to Columbus in 2018, and that was after I traveled to France for three months, and I was just kind of like on year two of this, like, traveling a lot. I was in the Philippines the year before, and I was doing all these things, and I was getting these jobs and quitting them, and I <laughs> basically just wanted a community. I wanted to live somewhere, and an apartment, a room in Columbus came up that was very cheap, and that's where I lived my first three years there. I will never not mention it i was paying 200 dollars for rent and i still make I, I don't make much money so it freaking saved me and i moved there because i wanted to invest myself in a community i wanted to invest myself politically to a community i wanted to be around people i wanted to just honestly just feel what it is like to be in a community and to not leave after a year and and i wanted to date and i wanted to just do all of those kind of things in a way that could exercise and help me be radical and be an artist. And I did get a lot of those things in Columbus. Columbus was a really good place in terms of like the city and the house that I lived in. It was a really good place to live as a poor artist and to be able to travel for weeks or months on end and to barely worry about my rent. That is something that was amazing about living there and that I'm always going to be grateful for. But I think at some point in my time there, I think it's two things I had. I mean, naturally, when you live in a place for a period of time, your friend groups fracture. And so I'd say during my four years there, I had two like sort of intensive periods of friend, my friend groups fracturing. The first one was a friend that um, needed to go through an accountability process in terms of like how me and other people in the community felt. And this person just had problems with mental health and <clears throat> and drinking and it that was the first real time that I like my friendships fractured in Columbus and I think it broke I think it just made me realize that when there are periods of crisis I sometimes put other people before myself because I feel like I can be a really good mediator and that was a big lesson because I realized like oh in situations where there's a lot of stress involved I need to actually think about what I want because that's not the most accessible mode for me all the time. Like I stand up for myself when necessary, but I think in other ways I can over intellectualize being an empath or compassionate in a way where I literally don't empathize for myself. And so it taught me a big lesson. And then I think the second time my friend group and kind of space kind of fractured was during the 2020 protests. I lost a lot of friends. I stop being friends with some people. I stopped organizing. I, and in 2020 in a lot of ways was really liberating, but also really painful and also going through a breakup at the beginning of 2020. Um, and, and then I think especially when the vaccines started happening and 
people started kind of being able to go out more. I started going to shows again for the first time in like months. And this is really being a minority, a token minority, or whatever you want to fucking call it. Okay, let me wait for this car to pass. But I would go to shows like when vaccines started coming out and people would come up to me and be like, oh my God, I love you. I see you on the... And granted, like I'm in Columbus. I'm not like, I'm not some big... I, I just post on Instagram and I love I love posting on Instagram. I love posting photos. But people, the way people would come up to me and talk to me, I felt like their image of me didn't match the image of myself that I show my most trusted friends. Meaning like Columbus can be really white depending on where you are. And I have a lot of friends in the music scene and the art scene and in these spaces. And I think over time I just became dissatisfied with kind of like what those spaces can offer me. And so I think on a social level with the pandemic, with friends groups splintering and like just me hanging out with more friends that maybe I vibed with on a creative level, but not necessarily on like a racial level or a cultural level. And so I think I really reached this point of being dissatisfied with going out and socializing with people all the time and feeling kind of bored and not nourished in ways that I think more diverse and POC oriented communities are. And so I think in Columbus, my double consciousness just really became something at the forefront of my mind. And it just takes a toll on you over time when you're one, not satisfied with how people understand you necessarily slash you're not satisfied with your community to the point where you hold certain things back or you don't express yourself as much as you want because you're like, this ain't really for me. This is not where I want to be expressing myself in this way. And, and then that's coupled with the pandemic. And so I think there were just so many things that came together to make me realize, like, I want to date more. I want to hoe around more. I want more diverse communities and going out and events and cultural events. And I just want to like take that dive into the next chapter of my life because I do feel like Columbus was a very important chapter, a very necessary chapter. But I feel like I knew that it was something that I would grow out of and move out of. And I had to kind of press the eject button and be like, this is it. And so that's why I applied to grad school and that was going to maybe be one way that I'd move. And then I wasn't satisfied with the grad school that I was accepted into. And so now I'm still planning to move. The plan now is to move to New York City later this year. I feel like what I want out of leaving Columbus and what's compelling me is that I want to discover more parts of myself. I feel like up until like 25, 26, I feel like I've understood myself as this artist, this person fleeing all this stuff and going out into the world and making all these opportunities and trying to get there and now I'm reaching a point where I'm making a turn in my career I'm gonna be an author I'm gonna receive and have more career opportunities um, I know I'm gonna continue to work hard and I want more things I want to date I want to I, I want to find other parts of myself that have been undiscovered thus far and I want to find parts of myself that I wouldn't dare be able to find in Columbus and I'm really compelled at this time in my life by that prospect and kind of what this leap of faith means another thing that has been compelling me as of recent is i mentioned this earlier in this episode but i have been going through a grieving process and it's interesting in numerous ways i mean one right before my book announcement happened i my writing mentor passed away and i'd known him for about seven or eight months we connected earlier that year through a black or i think it was a poc writer to writer mentee mentor program and his name um is kl bird and he was a father he wrote like i think middle grade books um i was on his podcast called the afronauts and he was just it was just such, such a good experience to have someone who was older even though i didn't necessarily agree with all of the advice but it, it was just nice to have someone older that i could go to for support who was black and I could just like text and be like, this weird thing happened or what What do you think I should do about this? Or am I freaking out or is this normal for me to react this way? And it was just so reassuring and he was so reassuring. And I think it was really sad when he passed away because one, it's sad when anyone you love passes away and especially under circumstances that aren't ideal or just are more painful than others. And I won't 
explain what that is because I don't feel like talking about how he passed, but um, I think announcing this book and having all these people congratulate me online while also grieving this person that represented a lot of me overcoming my doubt in this really hard process of trying to get this memoir published and feeling a lot of self-doubt and facing a lot of rejection. Like he really held me up in ways that I don't think many people could because he was older, because he was black. And it hurt to know that not everyone who supports you gets to see the book, the product, the the dream. And uh, even now it, uh, it's te- I'm tearing up, but um, it's hard when you know that not everyone's going to make it and you have to keep going and you want to honor them. But it's really, it's hard. It's hard being a black artist. And so when you find spaces and people of support, you hold on to them. And to lose that right around the time that my book came out, it just felt strange. It felt, I don't want to say symbolic, but it felt like something that I had to honor And so I added them to my book dedications. And then right before I left Columbus, I found out that a really good friend from college, like a really good friend that we used to like read poetry together and do poetry workshops and go to the same parties. He passed away. And uh, and through going to his memorial, I learned that he passed away just like a day or two after the last time I really texted him. And for him, it was just really hard because I haven't seen him that much. Like I have texted him. Like the last thing I really texted him was I love you. And it's, it's just so it's, it's hard in a way that I can't even really explain, which is maybe why I've been writing more poetry and poetry feels more abstract, but it it doesn't feel fair that this person is gone. And I didn't get to see them very recently. I saw him maybe a few months ago And it felt weird to be leaving Columbus and to be so ready to leave, but also knowing that I was leaving this state during a period of time that would be the last time that he and I lived in the same state together when he was alive. And it was just a lot to process. Like, And I I feel like it's just giving me a deeper language for grief in a weird way that's helping me write the book that I've been writing because... Like in the weeks since he's passed, I've just found myself looking up at the trees when the wind blows through them and kind of just thinking of him and trying to take more random photos and trying to take more notes. And one thing I loved about Stephen was that he just had hobbies that he dove into strangely and intensely and with vigor. And he thought so, You, I don't want to say uniquely, but he just, he was himself when he thought about things and answered questions and interacted with you and and I know he loved me and I know I loved him and it's it's sad when your physical journey with someone ends before you even have an understanding of like I don't know I I guess I just expected like he'd get old and get married and have kids and I'd get to see his kids and I always see him as one of those friends And so I know that my relationship with him will continue, but it's very strange to say goodbye to a four-year chapter of your life and to also sort of process in some ways saying goodbye to a friend. And I went to his memorial service maybe two weeks before I moved out of Columbus, and it was really great to see all these friends from college that knew him and know him and to cry together and to eat and to be there. And it also felt really final in a way that... I fought against like there was a tree planting ceremony in his honor and that was probably the hardest part of the whole thing because I just thought I don't know I I guess I just didn't like the symbol of it like of of burying something Um, and so it's giving me a lot to process and to think about especially in terms of my book like this whole novel that I'm writing is basically a coming of age through grief or a, a, a grief narrative, I guess you can say. And so it's just giving me a lot of like more complicated feelings because I love Steven. And I feel like a part of it is like, I feel like in some other universe, we maybe would have been lovers or <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, and I feel like when people will pass, it's like all these possibilities, all these almost or could have been or, the, all these things just kind of stop 
and they still live in me. But it's just sad that I won't get to see him again and banter with him in the same way that I've been able to in the past. <sighs> yeah. On the note of grieving and processing grief, I will say one big lesson that it's taught me is when I was at the memorial for Stephen and they were doing the tree planting ceremony, I, like, you know when you're going to cry and you can feel your body, like, tensing up and your energy is moving towards it and your heart's racing so you, you're you trying to stop yourself from, like, your heart racing and you're kind of, like, trying to hold it in. I basically started having a panic attack. <laughs> Not, like, a full-on panic attack, but getting ready to, like, it was coming out of me and I was like walking away and I couldn't look at the tree planting ceremony. And I think it was Steve, one of his family members, I think maybe an aunt came over to me. She put her arm around me and she said, remember to breathe, remember to breathe, remember to breathe. And I tried to do breath work here and there. I tried to do yoga here and there. But in that moment, I feel like it really taught me a big lesson about feeling something and being in the moment and even if it's painful if you breathe through it it's going to help you face it and 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 it taught me a big lesson about breathing through it and and just like taking in that moment and not trying to have it be something that it's not and so I breathe through it and girl, like I breathe through a lot of stuff now. I, I breathe more. I breathe through it more. Cause like when you're going through something intense and you're grieving and whatever, like it, sometimes you're you we we socialize ourselves to avoid these emotions. We go out, we avoid talking about it, or we post about it, but we don't talk about it. But I think we have to dive into the parts of our processing that are more vulnerable and that are more real and that are more confrontational, I guess. And so breathing through it really taught me like stand in that shit because you're here for a reason okay i'm just gonna keep going until this camera goes off okay next question is now that i'm turning 28 what lessons have i learned in my 20s i think this is an interesting question because i'm a very episodic person i'm a very chapter oriented person some lessons i've learned in my 20s i have learned don't put your self-worth in other people's hands I think in my early 20s, I was so invested in finding chosen family and community and making friends that sometimes I made compromises about what I was willing to accept or not accept from people or not necessarily what I was willing to intervene on because I think when the moment became necessary, I was willing to intervene on things. But I just think about like various jobs I've had in other places and circumstantial friends that I've had. And there have been many situations in my life where I've had circumstantial friends because of the environment I was in or the place I was living or working. And I feel like I look back now and I'm like, oh, there are certain points in this friendship or dynamic that I should have expressed my discomfort or I should have expressed a boundary or I should have said something. And especially moving to Columbus and going through that first kind of friend fissure or break that I went through in Columbus, it really taught me like when you're going through crisis and someone is hurting you or other people or being toxic or rude or bad to them like if you're one of the people involved in the harm or is upset like think about what you want like they don't don't just divert your feelings and your mediation skills to other people like also give that gift to yourself and it's and, and maybe that's why I've sort of grown out of Columbus in the ways that I have because I feel like in my early 20s I would continue to kind of like keep trying to like I don't know, walk down the same road when you're like, I don't want to go where this road is leading me anymore. Um, and so I think now I kind of have learned to honor my desires and intentions in a way that I wasn't able to in my early 20s. I think also now I, I don't know, I feel like in my early 20s, I was trying to prove more on a career level, not meaning like I, I wanted to get to a certain level and like do all these things, but I wanted to be a writer. And now that I am a writer, I'm just kind of like, oh, I got this shit. And so... I don't know. This is a hard question. Like, what lessons have I learned? I've learned people can be shit. I've learned the world can be fucked up. I've learned the National Guard could come into your city and tear shit up. I mean, it's there's, there's too many lessons. Like, I, on a political level, I think I've learned we have to continue developing new language for the things that we're experiencing. Like, I think 
especially with the way the West and the U.S. plays with identity politics, we can get so subjugated into these holes. And I do think solidarity with your people is important. Being like defending black people, defending queer people is important. But I do think even within those boundaries and across those boundaries, we have to develop new languages about what we're experiencing to deepen our understanding of the political conversations that we're having. And that in translation means like a lot of the times I have political conversations with people. And I think one thing I learned in my 20s is that two people can be using the same words to describe what they think about something. But one of those people might not know that there's another word that can more accurately describe what they mean. And to give an example, a few weeks ago, I was debating with a friend, a black person, and they were saying, oh, I don't hate Trump because when Trump came into power, like Hispanics and Latinx people were like being trashed in the media. So black people got a break. And by the end of the conversation, I, one, held this person to account for being like, you don't want people to shit on black people, but you're saying it, you're, you want to be complicit in other minority groups being subjugated and shitted on. And two, by the time we reached the end of the conversation, I realized that like we came to a point where I was able to get this person to say, like, I have anger towards immigrants of privilege, immigrants of financial means that come here and then are anti-black to other people, not necessarily poor immigrants or poor people or people that are immigrating here and live in the hood. And I was like, that is a class distinction. That's a class distinction. And I mentioned that because we were using the same language throughout the conversation. And one way that I enter political conversations is trying to figure out what critical questions to ask people to get to a more honest or more specific place. And I feel like that's been a big lesson of my 20s. It's like two people can identify as like socialists or Marxists or liberals, but they might be on totally different spectrums of even that political identity. And I think getting to the specificity of what we're talking about also means that we can give more specific language to the solutions that we imagine, This is to the solutions that we want to present. And so in my 20s, I feel like that was something big that I learned. Um, other lessons, um, when you're in a relationship, don't stay in it because you want to be someone who's capable of being in a relationship. <laughs> don't mean to call myself out, but, um, went through my first relationship in my twenties, ended it at the beginning of the pandemic. For me, it was a big thing to end a relationship that I feared for so long that I wouldn't ever be capable of having, like, no one's going to love me or no one's going to see me that way. And in this relationship, I, I felt loved. I loved this person. And I definitely felt more loved in many ways by this person than I felt like I was able to love them. And some of that is the logistics and circumstances of the relationship. It was long distance. We didn't communicate all that much outside of physically seeing each other. Um, and so I, I feel like I reached a point where I was like, I don't think this is serving me in the ways that I want a relationship to serve me. And I'm willing to say no to this and to figure out what else is out there and right now i'm at a point in my 20s where i'm kind of figuring out how to date again how to flirt again how to do all these things again and that's kind of like what this summer's about like i want it to be a hot boy summer but i don't want it to be like i mean i want to be i want, I want it to be a hot boy summer i don't want to be a thirsty ass boy summer like i think being thirsty is fine but i feel like it's just never my vibe unless i'm really into someone i don't know i don't know it's also europe so like a lot of men i'm like are you gay or bi? It's like they're straight. They're just European. Oh my God. So yeah, I've learned a lot of things in my twenties. That's what this, <laughs> this, this could teach you. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. On to the last part of this video. Um, what creative lessons have you learned over the past few years as, as your creative career has developed? First lesson is the only person that can invest in you from the start is you. I think it's important to have support systems and people around you that are creative or supportive or are passionate. But to me, the behind the scenes work is what proves to yourself that what you believe in is worth it. It's how you prove to other people that what you believe in is worth it. And it's how you prove your commitment to it. Because I know for me, I care about writing so much that I don't care if other people think my writing is good. There's something that I'm trying to get out of it. There's something that I'm trying to explore that matters a bit more than external validation. And I think understanding that from a very early age, only you can really invest in yourself. You are going to be your best marketer. You're going to be your best advocate. The more that you work on your craft behind the scenes, the more you give yourself a body of work, a an analysis, a lens, an approach, 
that you've worked on, that you've honed, that you've defended on a personal level. And so when it comes time for there to be difficulties in your career, yes, they will suck. They will hurt. When I was on submissions, I cried every rejection, basically. But I do think that the work that I put into that book and all of the other work that I put into writing, even when I did doubt myself, it told me, like, you're doing this for a greater reason, even if this short-term outcome isn't happening. And so knowing that it comes from within you to start is really important and it helps it it helps you not get caught up in external validation because external validation can be good but you also need it from within another big lesson that i have learned is and maybe this is just a basic ass lesson revision revision is so important in in writing and honing your craft with my memoir i feel like revision just help sharpen the scenes it helped me figure out like a good editor like outside of yourself even will 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 see things in your book that you won't even see and and i guess in terms of like self-editing and self-revising um with this novel i've been revising it since 2021 so pretty much like a, i'd say i've been revising this book for about a year and that's a lot of back-to-back -back revisions but i'm definitely one of those writers where if I have an idea of what needs to change in the book, I'm going to take notes along the way, even while I'm writing that draft, and then look at those notes later and think about why. Um, and so it's been really amazing for me to revise fiction, especially because, one, I think it's amazing how what you're working on creatively can line up and help you process things in your life, aka I mentioned this earlier, but writing a book about grief and also going through a grieving process. And then two, um, getting to know your characters more and more. Like I think sometimes when you're beginning as an author you kind of have this idea that your characters are going to jump off the page and you'll know everything about them but i love the revision process because it's taught me there's always more about my characters i'm going to discover and the more i've revised my book the closer i felt to certain characters in ways that i couldn't have imagined like basically to me my main character my novel he feels like my younger brother and so i want to protect him but i also know i'm like you're you're gonna do you one way or another <laughs> um and so I think that's a really beautiful feeling and lesson to have. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I mean, I think also as a marginalized artist, as someone who has experienced a lot of gatekeeping, another big lesson is it's who you know, or it can be who you know. Like, of course, put the behind the scenes work in, do that work, but also do the work to be your best marketer, to make yourself discoverable, to have your work be out there in a visible way that's searchable, that's findable online, and and be vulnerable with people that um, you trust and admire or revere, and also give them the space to not <laughs> be revered, because I think pe when people come up and they have a lot of success, their, their worlds kind of get smaller. And what I'm saying is basically... There have been writers that I've admired and in various ways I've been able to like interact with them or get closer to them or just learn from how they've handled success and not trying to force those relationships and allow them to happen and allow my craft and my just like sense of natural expression to allow that to be what connects me to these people as opposed to like this idea of networking. That's helped me a lot um, and it's helped me shit, get my book deal because I had written a few essays under Hanif. It's helped me get to know other writers in Columbus that um, I think are pretty prominent and just like pick their brains every once in a while, um, be their friend. Um, huh, so those are my lessons. And thank you again for watching this special episode of The Creative Hour. It feels weird to be doing this on my birthday of all day. I mean, not weird, but I was planning to do this yesterday and now it's today. And I feel like, wow, I actually have like a visual track record of what I was doing today. And to give you a sense, like I'm trying to cook all of the food that I have left in my fridge. I'm sort of putting my stuff into an area and I'm going to start packing slowly today. And tomorrow these travels get on the road. I, I, I think the main thing I'm really nervous about, I'm like, my duffel bag is going to be heavy. It's not like I didn't overpack but i definitely i have two pairs of pants that i don't even think i will have by the end of the trip i have two sweaters i don't think i even need that and like everything else i'm just like do i need <laughs> i don't know but um yeah so i love talking i love blabbering i love sit down chatty kind of conversations and i'd love to know in the comments if you want more video episodes of the creative hour um i'd love to 
figure out and tackle doing video interviews and I definitely do have some zoom interviews I can convert into a YouTube video um, so let me know in the comments and thank you for listening again and stay tuned for more episodes of the creative hour I think season two will probably have about I think there's been five or six episodes in the season and I think I have like three or four more to go but um thank you for listening and see you around Thank you.